Do a live <laughs> <laughs> yeah, No doubt. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, we're on YouTube now. Sweet. There we go. Good. Let me pull up YouTube here, guys, so I can see us too. So there we go, Ryan. We should be All good right. to go on YouTube. We are good to go on YouTube. So thank you, everybody, for patiently waiting with us. This is our first attempt at doing a YouTube live for our podcast. So <laughs> it is, um, yeah, it's new. So thank you for hanging in there. Um, yeah. We're just kind of getting the last stuff prepper, prepper, prepared, preparated. Um, Chris is just crushing his grains. Uh, and he's going to walk us through. So if you need to take another minute to get some water, make sure you do have a glass of water with you. As we walk through the tasting, you're going to want to um, clean your palate before each or between each beer. Maybe some uh, cheese and crackers as well to help, you, yeah. to help balance that palate out between beers. Um, we will also kind of be jumping back and forth. We do have a presentation to share with you with some facts and information about malt, the malting process that Chris is going to walk us through. So Feel free to drop your chat or your messages in your chat there. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you have that come in. Um, we're going to try to stay high level on the science, as Chris will say. We'll, we'll go into it, the basics of it. But, uh, you know, if, we're, if you really want to get scientific, um, definitely give us a message uh, in the DMs there. And, and we can give you some information on the, uh, on the other side of this. So um, first off. Thank you everybody for joining Chris Lee from high gravity supply co um, also known as a tail in every pint. He's the man behind some awesome craft beer gear um, and home brewer extraordinaire. Chris, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me guys. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. My pleasure. And always with me is my bearded brother, Robin. Good yes, to sir. see you, man. Good to see you too, man. And it's good to finally be able to sit on the podcast and enjoy a drink together. Yeah, no doubt. It's uh, dry <laughs> January has been a, a real role and um, it's not anymore. Technically. <laughs> no. <laughs> Once I found out about fry dry in February, I said, I might as well just do that in January, right? 28 days is long enough. <laughs> Check your balances. But uh, yeah, so Chris is going to walk us through um, some beers and some, some grains or some malts that'll be specific to each of the beers. Um, the beers we're going to be looking at today is Amsterdam Blonde Lager. Um, I didn't realize these came in such large cans now. That's a good to know for the summer when you're mowing the lawn. Yep. Um, a classic, oh, I should suck that line. Um, a classic the India Pale Ale Sierra Nevada. Chris is gonna talk to us about this one a little bit and why I call it a classic. Um, a very, very solid beer from uh, Henderson's Brewing, Henderson's Best, Amber Ale. This is a, a nice classic crushable beer and always accessible at the local LCBO or at the brewery. And finally, from Hamilton, we got Clifford Brewing and their, their staple porter. My opinion, probably one of the best porters you can buy in Ontario um, on the regular or even on seasonal basis. This one just continues to be consistent. And we're going to be lining those up with, and Chris, why don't you tell us what malts we're going to be going with today? Uh, we're going to go through a couple different malts. Uh, we're going to start with just a base malt, which is a, a two-row, which is this guy here. Um, the two-row, if we go to the Amsterdam Blonde, this is the only malt that's in that beer, so that's why we chose that beer. Uh, the next one is a, a light caramel. This is a Caramel 60. Um, this one is featured inside of the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, and you'll see there's probably this, and I don't know the exact recipe of Henderson's Best, but there's definitely some crystal caramel malt somewhere in there. Uh, then we have a pale chocolate, so it's a light chocolate malt. Uh, this you'll find there's probably a little bit of this. I would I would I would think there's a little bit in the uh, in uh, in Henderson's best, but there's definitely going to be some variety of chocolate malt inside of uh, Clifford Porter. And the last malt is a specialty malt. This is a uh, Carafa Two. This is a a, a very deep bittered deep bittered uh, malt that's really chocolatey. Uh, you get a lot of dark 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 chocolate and things like in that nature on it. We'll talk about it more when we get there. Perfect. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. And um, just as you guys know, I looked over at the YouTube and it tripped me out because there's a 20 second delay. I see Chris talking about the malt. So I got to remind myself when I look over here. Um, again, feel free to drop chats in guys. We are, um, this is a, like an amazing experience. We, we had actually thought about having Chris on just to chat beer and Chris suggested we, you know, take it to the next level and, and try something new. Um, he listened to one of our recent podcasts and we were talking about the other flavors we'd love to learn about. And uh, yeah, so 
here we are learning about malts, which as a person who's been drinking craft beer for, you know, almost 15 years, but longer than that, maybe getting old. Um, I, I remember malty beers. I remember malt, you know, IPAs that leaned into malt uh, more. Really? So I'm, I'm really super excited for this because I've never really thought about the malt profiles, just knew that they were there and recognized them that they were in the beers I was drinking. So this is awesome. I'm super pumped. Yeah, I think uh, in the current state of things, all that anybody ever, ever talks about is hops. But um, I mean, malts, the way that you use them in the beer and you build the recipes is a really it's really cool. It's a cool science on its own. Uh, it probably doesn't get the same sort of, uh, you know, hype beer recognition. I don't as, as you know, hops do. I can't remember the last time everyone's like, oh, this new multi beer is coming out. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, fixed ones. <laughs> yeah, there's so little focus on that, man. And, and you know, it's funny because like without the malts you wouldn't fundamentally have a lot of the food that the yeast need to then go on and do what they do to create the beers that we have it is one of the four core ingredients that you always need to have Absolutely. or as we like to call them the four elements uh-huh. <laughs> 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 um, so i'm just going to pop up chris going to walk us through kind of the overview of what we're going to do today so i'm just going to show you guys kind of the agenda um chris if you want to just kind of walk us through uh what we're going to talk about today yeah, sure. So just a couple little, uh, like, like, once again, we're going to try and keep things sort of high level. Um, as I was mentioning to uh, Ryan and Robin just before we started, there's, there's a lot of things that you can easily steer into some very deep science. So we're going to try and jump over very high level on a lot of those things without going into, you know, uh, plot holes that'll take us into strange directions. Um, so we're going to go through a couple of things, uh, just really quickly defining what malt is. If you are unaware, just a really, again, really light overview on it. Uh, we're going to do an overview on making malt. So how does... How do you get something that is like this is this this malt and this malt are the exact same ingredient but how do you get this version and how do you get this version it's kind of like coffee beans right uh and then we're going to talk about the flavors and malts sort of like what we're going to talk about here uh we're going to eat a couple of well the three of us anyways are going to eat some malts we're going to smell some malts and then we're going to try and pick up some of the aromas uh and the flavors from these guys inside the beers we're going to test out too uh we're talking a little bit about base malts and specialty malts a base malt like two row uh specialty malt like Carafa too. Um, differences in how you use them and stuff like that. Uh, the mashing process really quickly, how you, you know, turn all of this stuff essentially into a raw form of beer. And then uh, we're going to just do some malt and beer tasting, which is kind of where I think everyone just wants, wants to get the malt and beer tasting. So let's just try it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's I think the bonus Chris did this maybe on purpose was that we, there's a large beer to start us off. So while you're, while we're oh. listening and going through the malt process, you could enjoy, start to enjoy some of the blonde while we're waiting and going through um, and learning about, you know, exactly that, the malt flavors, the uh, low bond scale, which um, is, you know, new and new to me that Chris will highlight us on as well. Me as well, man. Uh, so what is malt? So I, I'll, I'll go off on this one. Uh, Wikipedia says malt is germinated cereal grain that has been dried in a process known as malting. The grain is made to germinate by soaking in water and then is halted from germinating further by drying with hot air. Um, little history lesson in Mesopotamian days and in very ancient times, Egyptian uh, times as well, when they brewed beer, it was like a cereal because the grain would remain in the in the mix and they would actually have to do, you know, drink it with giant straws or sp almost ladle type spoons to ingest their beer. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's interesting that uh, it's, and probably we're all thankful now that the evolution of beer has brought us to stuff that we can actually uh, just swallow without having to pick our teeth out of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Filtration. Thank you, Seth. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Could you imagine sitting down at a community beer bowl and just, you know, sucking up some porridge beer? I mean, <laughs> we're not that far from it right now. <laughs> hey, at least you wouldn't need to eat then. Maybe that's where the whole Guinness idea came from. You know, <laughs> you drink a Guinness, that's like a meal. Next hype beer, unfiltered grain beers. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I was kind of hoping that raw ales would have taken off, but you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you tell us a little bit about how malt's made there, Chris? Sure. Um, I mean, if you guys, if there's anybody that's uh, familiar with the process of coffee, it's, it's very similar to how we process coffee from a coffee cherry to coffee bean. Um, coffee's a little bit more simple in the sense that your coffee bean goes on a scale from one to five. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, like a dark roast is a five. A breakfast, you know, a breakfast uh, coffee is like a one. Um, the lighter the roast, the more caffeine that's for coffee. Um, so, with malt, it's a similar sort of thing. The, um, they're all, they all come from the same sort of colored base. So that's like a, a base malt there. 
Um, as you cook them, they go darker, much like a, much like a you know piece of toast if you leave it in the toaster too long. Um, so the first process on it is steeping. So the, the 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 raw kernels are soaked in water for typically about 24 to 48 hours to absorb the to absorb moisture and begin the germination process. Um, what that essentially does, it's like if, if you've ever planted a plant, you ever done that where you like take the seed and you put it in a wet napkin so that that's germ mm -hmm. it's basically germination, same sort of thing. It's kind of sprouting it there. Yeah, and that's and that just kind of gets gets a a little bit of science process in the grain going uh, in the germination part here. So once they do start germinating. Kernel, the kernels sprout rootlets and open up starch reserves. Um, when we get to mashing, that's when we need the starch from the grain to convert into sugar for the yeast to eat to make beer. So that kind of goes further down the road as to where our conversation is. Perfect. And on and, the right, uh, the right hand side is the Lovi bond scale you were telling me about earlier. Yes. So um, what that basically does, that comes in in the kilning process. So the final step of the milk creation is uh, it's kiln. It's basically uh, heated. It's almost like if you took something and stuck it in the oven and heated it at a time temperature and certain moisture to get different flavors and different types of malt out of it. Um, a pale malt uh, like this is like, if you look at the Logibon scale there, this is going to be like a two to three. Okay, like wow, that's quite low. It's really low. It's, there's nothing in it. It's, it's bright. Anything that's going to be like your crispy boys, uh, any old German beers, uh, well, I mean, clear German beers, anyways, are going to be in like basically a single grain for the most part, uh, and that's just that really, really bright lobby bond. Um, if you look at Amsterdam Blonde, that's about a two or three lobby bond. And then obviously, the the longer you toast the grain for, it's going to go kind of all the way around that wheel, um, and then you get into the you know the, the darkest colors of grains, which is going to be six hundred. Um, this carafa, I believe, is a I have the numbers later on the chart. I think it's like a five, a 450 or a 500 on the scale. So it, it's pretty, it's almost as dark as you can get. You can see, I'll show the comparison to those who can see on the video there between the yeah. carafe and the tomb of the... Yeah, it, yeah, you can see the ma major difference. This reminds me of being out know, Saskatchewan, like the two row or the, the clear, it reminds me of like being in the wheat fields, you know, we chewing on cracked wheat, like that's, the same visual I get from seeing that clear malt. It's the smell too. I crushed up the malts before I come back in and it felt like my uh, my office smelled like a grain mill. It just smelled amazing. <laughs> just don't light anything in there, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> that's another room. <laughs> so that's perfect. So it, for the Lovey Bond scale, when we talk about the malts and, and choosing your malts, so I see on the scale, like it does give a wide variety, but is it common for brewers to mix, um, say a crystal with a, a chocolate, uh, malt. Is that, is that a common practice? Absolutely. Um, it's much like mixing, mixing different colors together. Um, if you start with something really bright, like if we took a two row and then we blended in some, some chocolate, depending on the percentage, like if you put maybe 2% of this, the resulting beer would probably be like a red. So you're going right. to, it, it kind of meets halfway with stuff. So, um, it's a finer science than, me as a home brewer, I pay. I don't pay too much attention to it when I when I brew a beer. I'm not like I'm not trying to nail that that you know that specific color that we get out of it. Um, but professional breweries obviously would be would pay a lot more attention to that because they want to make sure that your Henderson's best has that same cherry red every single time and it doesn't waver from it. So I got a question for you. You you kind of said that sometimes what they'll do is they'll take a a malt that's lower on that scale, mix it with a malt that's higher on that scale, and given that this is a scale. You know, if you're kind of sitting at a two and you're at, you know, mixing it with a 250, maybe you'll fall at like somewhere halfway. Now, my question is, why would a brewery choose to not just go with a malt that's brewed halfway rather than using one that's super bright and one that's more toasty? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's a perfect question, actually. So if you, the way I like to look at these two and the way that I was taught was that uh, you look at malts kind of like all the different spices you have. And you see my spice candidate over there behind my slow cooking pork shoulder. Um, <laughs> All the different spices you have, uh, like something like a two row might be like a base spice, like a pepper or a salt. But then this might be like, you know, cumin. This might be, you know, it goes on and on. Got it. You want to, you want to, you want to build a flavor palette by taking a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. And depending on the style, you're going to want a little bit of this in it to pull out a certain character. You might want some pale chocolate to get bright chocolate notes, but then you also put in some darker chocolates to get more of that cacao and like you know if you bit into like a 90 percent chocolate bar like that really dark kind of, so that would come more from this this small than it would from that 
Got it. Got it. That totally makes sense. Yeah. We talk more about that as well when we get to the, uh, when we start tasting the beers too. Yeah. And I think that leads in kind of to the next topic point too. I'm just going to pull, pull up here, which is the malt flavors. So you're now you're, you're kind of talking about your, your proverbial spice rack of malts. And I know anybody who's been into a brewery, there's bags and bags and bags of grains <laughs> stacked in the back. Um, I know I went to little beasts uh, a couple years ago and they actually had a couch built out of their grain bags for their Nintendo room for the kids to play on. Like grains are like the part of beer. So when we talk about malt flavors and stuff, what are we, you know, what are brewers typically looking for from say the grains we're getting here today? Uh, it, it really depends on the style you're brewing. So you kind of, you kind of look at the style and you sort of work backwards. Um, so this, this particular chart here is a flavor, a flavor wheel by a, mal, a malt circle called Weyermann. Um, so this is their, this is their pale, their pale ale malt. So their, their specific version of this, this pale malt. So their malt, if you look at the different characteristics on the side, um, I, lo I love these charts, they're really cool. They have, a, so it's a, kind of a one to five, like what kind, of, what kind of characteristics does this particular malt build? Okay. Um, if you go to their website, you can look at any of their malts and you get a different chart for every malt, which is really, really cool. So if you wanted to brew a stout or a porter that was gonna be super chocolatey, you can literally go to their website and search for a malt that has like a five in dark chocolate. Uh, like if you want, uh, wow. I don't know, like a smoky malt, you can get peated malt and would have a five of malt. And you sort of find a way to blend those two, those together to bring out all the different types of flavors you want in that finished product. Uh, so that's how that's people, awesome. that you see, um, I call them clear, clear coffee stouts, but you know, we get those, um, blonde stouts. Is that similar to what you're saying? So they would just go look for a, a clear grain that, you know, embodied more coffee roast flavors or chocolate flavors than your typical chocolate grain. I think if I'm not mistaken, a coffee blonde, they, they, if I'm not mistaken, they don't use malts, but they actually use coffee in the secondary. To get uh, ad, I think it's, it's via adjuncts. I could be wrong. I've never made one myself. Um, but if we took like, for example, let's say like an English beer, if you look in the bottom kind of left, left wheel, left end of that wheel. Most English beers are really sweet, sweet and malty. They tend to have a little bit of that marmalade biscuity kind of character characters in it as well. Mm -hmm. So you like if you if you choose an, an English an English uh, an English or British um, base malt like a Maris Otter, you would see that it's it's more accentuated in that in that sort of area. So okay. I mean, there's, there's there's different ways to accomplish the task. Is kind of the point I'm trying to get to. But... Perfect. It says whole kernel. So is that also kind of a key factor here? As we look at either whole kernel versus milled grain, does that make a difference too on this scale? Yep. Exactly why we have. Oh kernels and we've got milled ones here so we're going to try we're going to try them you'll notice a little bit of a difference between it too so mm -hmm. yeah and, and i don't for for maybe anybody who might not be familiar with the process do we talk about we do talk about milling a little a little bit down the line don't we yeah, yeah. okay perfect yeah so well, watch me get my rolling pin and crush some more grains on my counter i'm more than willing to do that too so. right exactly <laughs> and the myard reaction chris it, it sounds like it's kind of just the process of caramelization of these malts is what's happening as they're getting toasted it kind of like the same way when you're toasting the sugar on a stove top it's just caramelizing and the flavors are getting richer and richer and that's exactly what it sounds like it's happening with the malts like exactly as you warm them up more and more it caramelizes more and more the flavor gets that much richer that's just yeah. wild um, I, I, ironically, I was, <laughs> so I, when I was putting, putting together this presentation, I was re -re reviewing all these concepts again. And this past week, I'm outside, I'm making shish kebabs, and I brought them inside. And, uh, and my daughter didn't want to eat a pepper because it, was, it, would, it would look black. And I told her, it's, it's, it's my re uh, Mylar reaction because it's just the sugars from the barbecue sauce and the pe natural sugars of the pepper is being heated until they turn crispy. And, you, and it, like if you bite something that's been on the barbecue, it's full of flavor, right? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what you're tasting. You're tasting those sugars getting cooked. Totally makes sense. That's awesome. Perfect. I'm just going to check to see if we got any any questions in the YouTube here. I keep forgetting we're running live on that. Guys, don't forget if you have any questions, top them in the chat there, and we'd be happy to see if we can answer them. Um, and let's get on to so the next we're going to be talking about is base malts versus specialty malts. So we and we kind of did touch on that a little bit. So we'll get you to elaborate a little more, Chris. I'll pull up the slide again here and. I'll go back one slide too. I, think, I just want to make sure we hit all the points there. Yeah, oh yeah. So the with, with mylar with the mylar reactions, it's basically all the, the sugars cooking in the grain. Um, the the way that you get those flavors, which is a pretty fun thing to, to talk about as well, uh, is through moisture, temperature, and time. So the maltster who is kilning the grain, if they're trying to make a you know a very I don't know, 
a bitter or smoky, whatever it is, malt. They have, they have a, they've got it down to fine science where they need this much moisture in the, in the kernel to start. They put it under this much temperature for this much time. And that's how you get all these different flavors. So if you think wow. of all the malts we have in front of us, all four of them are the exact same malt, but they've just been processed and well cooked, really. They've been cooked differently to get different reactions out of the malt. That is so cool how it's so multi-purpose, man. Like that's unbelievable. That one ingredient will give you such a broad spectrum of flavors. That's one of the most incredible things I've actually seen out of one ingredient. Because like you were saying earlier, sometimes as a cook, you might lean on salt, you might lean on cumin, you might lean on all these different things. But this is fundamentally one malt. And the only thing that's changing it is the level of toast that you're giving it. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, it's like one of the, like the, like this, the crystal malt that you're looking at here. So you get a crystal malt, and the crystal malt will have like um, you'll get like cherry flavor, you get raisins, like all your stone fruits. Depend, you can get a lot of those kind of flavors out of these. So depending on what degree of crystal malt you get, um, I know as as um, the way that they make them, when, when um, they use a lot of moisture in the kernel and they cover it, so the moisture stays in in the kiln. And as they cook it, there's a lot of moisture in it, and that's what helps to kind of bring out those flavors. Oh, huh. that's pretty of, crazy. Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't have, even realize that. Market it really high for a long time or really low for a long, long time. Right. So, so let me ask you another question, Chris, as a, as a home brewer, are you the one that's sitting at home that's buying these malts in one condition and then in the kiln that you probably have in your basement or somewhere toasting it to the point where it's getting to this, or do you normally purchase these like pre-toasted? Pre-toasted. Yeah. Um, I have, I have done the odd experiment. Um, I should probably document. I've done it once where you take pale malts and then stick it in the oven. Don't mind my mm -hmm. dogs. <laughs> pale malt, uh, stick it in the oven and you can actually like you can take pale malt and make a different malt out of it by just putting it in your oven and trying to figure that formula out but um i'm I, i've done that once and i didn't really get a great reaction out of it i didn't really know what, what to do with it but um i when i purchase stuff usually from like you know toronto brewing or short finger or those guys um you buy it pre-bagged like um for example that was a, a pound of chocolate malt hmm. So it just comes, yeah. it comes like this. I mean, this is a whole kernel. Some some places you can buy them pre-milled. Um, for specialty malts like this, that's not a base malt. I tend to keep them whole kernel and I'll crush them up when I need them because they stay fresher longer. Fair enough. Yeah. Did you want to, I just uh, pulled the screen bigger. Did you want to show that first bag too back up to the camera there, Chris, that you, the, the malt there? The chocolate? Yeah, the chocolate one. Just, I, I, I know you're showing it and I had the camera so small we were, we were broad showing it. So yeah, you can see the colors real good in the bag. Yep, it's just a that, that's a pale chocolate. It's a pretty mild malt chocolate. It's got a little bit of coffee and stuff inside of it too. So that almost looks like cacao nibs just at first glance. You know, I, I'm actually I'd be interested to kind of compare the colors to see what the, if the flavors look somewhat the same. But yeah, it's still actually I didn't even I hadn't even realized that it was all basically a single malt that was cooked differently. That's kind of it's like you go back to the spice thing. That's like basically taking salt and making salt have different flavors in, I, you know, I, I, that's not as easy to do with salt because it's a mineral, obviously, <laughs> but you get smoked salt maybe, but I think that's pretty interesting. I'd love to see if like, I guess that's a whole other science that we be diving into on another day. That's a yeah. rabbit hole in its own. We're, we're just talking about malt. There's also adjuncts. Uh, we're not talking about wheat. We're not talking about other cereal grains that brewers use and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. So, I mean, uh, if you look at like a Hefeweizen, a Hefeweizen, a Hefeweizen is more, usually is about 50% like pale malt and 50% wheat. Right. So, but I mean, wheat is a whole different other thing again. So. Fair enough. Sweet. So we have, uh, so you're good. We can move on to the next slide if you're good. Yeah. It's like yeah. making toast. I like making toast. I like making <laughs> toast. Some like, some of us like it lightly toasted. Some of us like it burnt. Yep. Some of us likes it burnt. But... <laughs> you got to find that sweet spot. Yeah, I know you're you're a, you're a dad, Chris. You always end up if you're down to the last uh, run of toast at breakfast, you eat the burnt toast, right? Like I do. I, I'm a I'm a I'm a I'm a very big lover of bread, so in all of its forms, I don't care if it's burnt, the end piece, like. <laughs> crust, <laughs> end piece, anything, anything. Like, yeah, that's too good. So we have base malts and specialty malts. So. Um, what are the difference between the two? And I mean, I know you said we do have two here. So while you're talking, I'll, I can show them to the, uh, the camera here for a better view. Yep. So, uh, just reading those. So, I mean, base malts are primarily used to add fermentable sugars to beer. So the, the primary amount of beer. So, um, and obviously fermentable, fermentable sugars are going to be for what your yeast use as food to make alcohol and carbonation in beer. Um, these can include two row talking about here. Uh, pale malts, uh, lager malt, Vienna malts, Munich, they're all kind of in the same family. 
Um, if you have a, they're all very light malts that'll kind of be around 10 ish and south in the lobby bond scale. Um, if you think of like a, like a Vienna lager, that's a little bit richer color that tends to usually just be Vienna malt, hundred percent of the grain bill. Um, but you can also get a little bit darker color on it based on how you, you mash it and cook it and so on and so forth. Um, so they, these need to be mashed down to break, break uh, the sugars, break the, the uh, sugars into it, into uh, simple sugars for fermentation. Um, specialty malts are like the other three that we have here on the table. So these are mainly used for, for adding flavor and aroma. So I got a question about the specialty malts because I know we talk about like um, the clear, the crystal malts for being your lagers and your pilsners. And hazy beers are obviously all the, you know, all the rage. So is there a specific, you know, malt that would be used in a hazy beer that brewers would tend to lean on? Or is it again, more of a variety, like you said, to get that mix in color? Uh, honestly, the most, most of the, um, the haze from hazy, from the majority of hazy beers comes from the yeast. Um, right. There's a yeast called London Fog. Um, what it does, so if you look at it, you have your Amsterdam Blonde, you see how clear that is? So that's, uh, it, it's a, whatever yeast they use in there flocculates really well. And that just means it, it settles. So when they make the beer and it ferments, yeast settles out at the end of it. So you get a really clear beer. Uh, London Fog suspends a lot inside the, uh, inside the beer itself. So that's how you get that kind of hazy, hazy, uh, hazy appearance to it. Um, usually, most of the, mo the modern like IPA type beers, and I said usually, I'm sure someone will jump down my throat for saying this, but um, usually it's just a single base malt. Um, they might add some other things to add a bit more body, whether it's wheat or like spelt is pretty common in a lot of beers, a lot of beers for, uh, for body and creating haze and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's typically pretty minimal on the, on, the, on the malt side, but then very heavy on the, the hop side. And you want to do that because you don't want a lot. Like if you drink a, like a, a hazy IPA, you're not tasting. Not, yeah, no malt. <laughs> It's an uppercut of, of lupulin, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's um, a good point. That makes sense. I did. I was just, uh, you know, kind of made me think whether or not, but you're right. You don't find malt flavors in those IPAs. So that'd be a fun talk though. Yeasts. That's a whole other science and it's all we'll have to get you back on to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Four elements. <laughs> right. Exactly. One of the other ones. And, and interestingly, wasn't a part of the Ryan Heights Gabbat until later on. Um, in the, uh, you know, in the, the building of the Reinheitsgebot. For those who don't know what the Reinheitsgebot is, don't Google it because I don't know how to spell it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the B Bavarian purity law of 14... 1560. 1560. Thank you. Yeah, Chris knows. Um, and yeah, so you can look up Reinheitsgebot. We'll tell you how to spell it later. Uh, but Chris is going to talk to us a little bit about the mash process now and, and kind of what turns our grain into that beer or, or the start of that beer. Yeah, so I mean, like the goal, obviously, once you have your, your malts, you have your grain bill put together. I mean, this, this chart here that I stole blatantly on the right hand side um, shows almost the entire process from it shows the entire process literally, literally from grain to grass in here, uh, grain to glass. Uh, so the, the, the mash process is basically where you where we take all the the, uh, the milled grains like this and we start to unlock all the sugars in it. Now, this is where things, this is probably the deepest bit of science that we're discussed today, but it's actually pretty cool stuff to know. Um, and yeah, we'll. We'll keep it high level again. Oh, that's my water. So <laughs> mash process is the conversion of starch and the grain into fermentable sugars for creating wort. And wort is basically your beer before you boil it and before you, sorry, it's the, it's your beer after, after it's boiled, before you put yeast in it to actually make it an alcoholic drink. It's just wort. It smells beautiful. It smells beautiful. It's, it's a sugary syrup. Mm-hmm. So um, the two main enzymes active during the mash are alpha and beta amylase. Amylase, alpha amylase, uh, which is most active in the range of 154 degrees Fahrenheit to 167 degrees Fahrenheit, creates long chain sugars that are less fermentable, resulting in a bit in a, a with beer that has more body in it. So if you look at a stout or a porter, something that you drink it, it drinks thick. They'd probably mash the beer at a little bit of a higher temperature because it leaves bigger chunks of sugar in, in the actual wort itself. So that's how you get more body in beer. Now I've got a quick question for you on that, on the mash process. Sure. <laughs> this is where it gets kind of sciencey. So, I have... <laughs> so when you're boiling off the mash, because you talked about it kind of creating this wort, which is something that feeds the yeast. 
are you sitting there actually measuring the sugar level of that afterwards to kind of see like, well, where do these sugar levels sit without talking about the complicated terms that go with that? Like you are then measuring the sugar levels, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, when you're, when you're putting together a grain bill, you want, there's a certain, there's a starting gravity that you want to get to after your mash. Uh, well, there's a, there's going to be, you're going to mash, you're going to start at a certain gravity reading. Uh, whatever that gravity is, that's going to be how much sugar is already in, in the wort right now. Okay. Um, the scale on that, if it's, uh, you know, uh, let's say like a lighter beer, you might start at like a 1050, 1046 or something like that. That's how much sugar is already in there. As you boil down, that sugar becomes more condensed. And then when you finish boiling, you're going to take another gravity reading and that gravity might be a little bit higher because you've boiled off some of the liquid. So there's more sugar per, more sugar per smaller volume of liquid inside the beer anymore. At, uh, at that point so whatever that gravity is that's your starting gravity when you pour yeast onto that the yeast eats through the sugar and that level will squish down till there's a little bit of sugar left in the beer and that's your body and that's where you kind of measure the the finishing gravity of the beer interesting uh, so and now for those beers that are the higher alcohol beers that likely means then and correct me if i'm wrong chris but then there's a higher amount of sugar that you're starting with, which could mean that there's a higher amount of grains that are being boiled down at that point in time to yes. then create that. Yes. So a high gravity beer, <laughs> um, you would like if you have <laughs> like a barley wine, for example, would be would have a gravity of maybe like uh, 1100 or something like that, like really, really high because there's a ton of sugar in there. Mm -hmm. And you need a lot of sugar if you want to produce a lot of alcohol at the end of it. Right. Um, like when you're doing barley wines and stuff like that too, you might need to have a gigantic amount of army of yeast to get through all that, or you might need to add a second batch of yeast to, to finish it down where you need it to get to. So. Oh, how interesting. I never even heard of that. A second batch of yeast that you'd have to put in. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah then this goes into stock fermentations and all this kind of... Wait, 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 this is, these are the plot holes. We're trying not to fall. <laughs> <Fair enough>. <laughs> <laughs> the plot holes, I love it. We get caught in... You, you've heard us. We can fall down those plot holes pretty <laughs> quick. Just bring up rap music and the three of us will go off <laughs> Yeah, we love hours. the details. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> too good too good so i think the next one we're going to talk about is actually the pale malt oh actually back up there's a second back part up oh yeah there you got a second yeah. part sorry chris so I'm, we, I'm like moving you through <laughs> that's, okay, that's okay so i mean the the second part is, is beta amylase which is another uh, which is another um uh element that's active uh, between 130 and 150 so it's uh and in, in those uh in that temperature range it'll trim off uh, single maltose, uh, maltose mm -hmm. sugars that are more fermentable. So, uh, a beer that's highly drinkable is going to probably be mashed at a lower temperature to make shorter sugars so that it's more fermentable. That's, it's that's got a lighter awesome. body, doesn't stick around in your, in your palate very much. Uh, that Amsterdam blonde is probably a good example of that. I'll give you higher attenuation. Uh, so when yeast is added, each sugars it produces carbon dioxide and alcohol. Yeah. All right. All right. On to the fun part here. We're going to make some malt tea in a minute. Now we start drinking. <laughs> now we start drinking. I kind of been cheating a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> it's been dry January. What's that, Chris? I haven't had anything to drink yet, I promise. Nice, uh, no. <laughs> grab the two roll that you guys have. Um, let's get the whole kernels first. I'm just going to grab a small amount of it, maybe like size of like a little. I'm going to actually turn this off here. Do you want me to keep the presentation up for you? Or? Uh, put it for just, just one sec, just so we can go over yeah. the high points. Of this Absolutely, brother. No worries. One sec. While we do that, Chris, I do want to thank you for sending out these malts to us. That was so yeah. awesome, man. Like, that's incredible. Chris sent these through baggies and all. Thank you. My mailman didn't think it was something else. <laughs> I know. I was thinking the same thing. It's like, what are these seeds that are being sent here? Well, you know, it's ironic. I didn't, I had all the plastic bags. I had everything weighed out and separated for you guys, but I didn't have any envelopes. So when I went to the, when I went to the post office, I was mailing out stuff in my business anyways. And then I had all these bags of like bags of malt. I was pulling out of my pocket. <laughs> and the people behind me, like <laughs> this guy. <laughs> What's he sending off? Bags. <laughs> Tony Maltana. Let's see you, my little friend. <laughs> okay, so the, the first malt we're going to talk about is is pale malt. Uh, this is a like like I mentioned before. It's a two to three lobby bond, so it's very very light. Okay, uh, one of the most common base malts in beer. Uh, it's a neutral malt that allows yeast, hops, and adjuncts to shine through in the beer. Uh, remember, we were talking about IPAs. This is a very neutral malt, so it doesn't contribute a lot of character, but it'll hold up all the stuff that does contribute character. Right. Makes sense. It allows for hops to be center stage, yeast to be center stage, and it just, it's a supporting role kind of thing. For yeah, the it's, the, 
the base. It's holding up the the rest of the flavorful beer that that you're looking forward to. Yeah. Um, this can be used anywhere up to 100% of the grain bill. Um, so Amsterdam Blonde, if you want to grab that right now. Uh, that guy. Uh, this, this beer actually is 100% pale malt. Uh, Amsterdam is gracious enough to put the recipe on their website, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 100% pale malt. So this, this, this grain basically turns into that. Super bright bright it's golden high clarity nice foam on top you can see me through it hello crispy boys <laughs> <laughs> and so it's other similar base malts are, we sort of touched on a few of them already maris otter golden promise uh, pilsner malt vienna malt they're all in the same category uh usually around 10 lobby bond and south of that so not much color but they're nice and clear so take take some of the malts first and i just want you guys to eat a couple pieces and just mm -hmm. tell me just remind, like I said, like reminds me of like eating crack tay or weed on the field and, and the farms is putting a dry grass in your mouth. Almost like uh, crackers and mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I get like uh, Ooh, malt, like malt balls almost a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you ever had those, um, like it tastes, it tastes to me like if you went to a bakery and bought a fresh loaf of bread, cut it right away and ate it, ate the crust specifically. Mm -hmm. that, that's what I taste in this. Mm. Mm. Those yeah. are actually delicious, man. This is a good snack. Hippies love it. Yeah, I mean, smell it too. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I smelt the milled stuff too. You can get a better smell out of that. Actually, that's probably a better idea, you know, what, for smelling it. Uh, for, for tasting it, it's good to, get, to crunch into it because you kind of get that flavor explosion in your mouth. It's like a, a organic, juicy fruit. <laughs> and uh, so if you smell it, your nose right in the glass. And what do you guys smell? Mm. Nice little breadiness for sure. Yep. Yeah, you definitely got that like whole grain bread. Again, I go back to I I I just I smell the farm, Chris. Like that's what I smell. Yeah, man. no, it's, it's just, true. It's true. Yeah. I smell hay, straw. That's it. Yeah, I just like bale and hay in the in the summer when I work for a, a summer yeah. bale and hay. That's exactly that smell. Just not. It's it's a lot cooler down here in the basement than it is up in the loft of that barn. <laughs> now, if you guys want, uh, take your dry malt. Let's add some water to it. We'll stir it up a touch. You don't need to put a ton of water in here, just a little bit, maybe like half a shot glass full. Um, we're just going to make a tiny little tea. Let that hang out. Yummy. Now, for anybody who hasn't been a part of the brewing process or been, been able to enjoy a brewery, uh, you know, that experience. I, I can tell you one thing, even just smelling this now, Chris, that's that beautiful smell when they're, when, when that, when you smell that ward at the brewery, like that's just such an amazing smell. Yes. I don't know what it is. Some people don't like it. I think it's, it's kind of like a little bit reminiscent of a bakery as well, though. Like, yeah. you know, you, you walk by a bakery and that like smell of fresh bread is almost mm. this kind of a smell. Yeah, when you, when you add the water to it too, it, it, it definitely accentuates the aromas that you're smelling out of it. It makes, you probably get, you might, you probably notice you get some different smells too. It almost smells like- um, I get a little oat smell out of it too. I was gonna say oats, you know, I, it almost smells like Roger's porridge. I eat Roger's uh, 12 grain porridge and that's what that smells like to me. Totally porridge smell, man. Yeah. It smells like, uh, like pizza dough. That's what I get. Mm. Oh yeah, pizza dough, good call, yeah. And you can see like, this is basically a mash now. So now that yeah. it's got- water in there you got you see all that all the the haze that's in there you'll notice the water's a little bit kind of there's a little bit of like gelatin in it too it's just all the stuff kind of, it, it has sorry it has that kind of appearance like it's it's thicker you know that's all the stuff coming out of it coming out of the malt now the like sugar the starches stuff, i guess stuff like that. wow and that's basically the start of a beer right there oh it tastes like um shredded wheat oh, man. almost with water I don't you put, put milk some in raisins in that and let it sit overnight. That's like overnight oats. <laughs> wild, right? Hmm. That is wild. Oh, man. I could almost drink that. I'm going to put that down, though, because there's a beer here that's made with those. <laughs> <laughs> Let's drink the beer. Yeah, that's right. The, uh, a fun thing, if you're a home brewer, uh, there's a secret. Well, not even a home brewer. If you're a brewer, there's a secret, there's a secret drink you can make. So when you make your beer, when you mash the beer in that process and you, and you, and you, and you, you drain everything off and get the grain off and you have the wort there before you boil, if you take a shot glass 
and get a, a get a shot glass full of that wort and put some whiskey in it. That is the greatest drink on the planet. Oh, that's a fun little tip. I have heard this recently. <laughs> yeah, what's it called? Isn't uh, there a name? I don't know what it's called. I've, I've had, people have told me it before. I've done it a couple times myself, and it just I try and make it a little traditional whenever I do whenever I make beer. But I always I tend to forget about it too. But it's a, it makes a fantastic little drink that like bars should be selling these things. I like I wish breweries had like you know a whiskey partnership and they can make these things because they have the hot wort and you know. Yeah. I, on to the beer. Let's go to the next slide. On to the beer. On to the next <laughs> slide. What do we got? Boom. All right, let's pull it back up here. So now it's beer time for all of those of us who have already been having this giant beer. Everyone's had Amsterdam uh, natural blonde before, I'd assume, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yep. um, way back in the day. Um, this is actually one of the oldest beer recipes that's still alive in Toronto. Um, I think this goes back, to, I think it says 86, 86 or 88. What does it say in the can? 86. 86. Uh, yeah, it's established 86. I don't know if that's Amsterdam or the actual recipe. The recipe is old. Um, many moons ago, I worked for I actually worked for Amsterdam for a short period of time, and I remember them telling me that this is one of the the older recipes that they still continue continue to brew today. That they really haven't changed all that all that much. Hmm. Uh, this is really simple. It's one grain. It's just your pale malt, super high clarity. Um, I chose this beer specifically because it's so easy to get a hold of, and you know, got to some Toronto breweries and stuff too. Um, it's basically just single malt yeast. And there's a couple different hops in it, some Noble Hops, Northern Brewer and Howler Tower. Um, those, those hops really come, they'll come across as like a little bit spicy and floral, stuff like that. Um, so, I mean, taste this beer and let's see if we can kind of connect some dots between the grain, the mashed grain and the beer itself. So let's see what we can come up with here. Well, yeah, you get that grass, like that long grass, hay, wheat, for sure on top. Oh, yeah. I still get the same straw, straw, like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I can still taste that in here. Almost like crackers too, like a little bit of cracker kind of base. I think the finish in the beer, is it, is it thick? Does it stick around a lot or is it just kind of gone when you drink it? It kind of hits up, stays a little bit in the back. Yeah, it does stay a little bit. I mean, not, not like some beers do, but it definitely does stay a little bit. It's clean. They probably, really clean. Uh, they probably mash this at a temperature that gets it very, very highly fermentable. Keeps it nice and dry. Finishes dry. Let's the you know the subtle the subtlety the subtle stuff from the, the yeast, which is probably pretty neutral in this beer, I would think, because I don't really get much yeast flavor, but I do get the kind of spicy the spice from the hops. You know, Chris, it's, it smells like I've got both of them, and it smells like if I were to cool this mixture of grains and water down and filter it out, it would fundamentally be this brewed beer. Like yeah, you can it, smell it right away. It gets you pretty close. And the fun thing is, oh, as so good. Here. We can uh, leave our little mini mat and mini shot mashes here to kind of hang out some more and see how that changes over time. That's fantastic. Now, this is classic. I actually like just talking about the beer itself. The fact that you said, you know, um, the craft beer scene in 1986 was not <laughs> anything what it was today. So it's pretty awesome that these guys are still putting out a, a beer that's recipe still holds up. That's a classic, classic beer right there. It's easy to drink. Um, that's one of those, you know, I drink, you know, if you drank Molson's or, you know, one of those clear mass produced macro beers, this is that maybe a transitioning point for a lot of beer drinkers to realize, oh, there's beers I like in the craft beer scene. It's not all big, juicy hazies or, or giant pastry stouts, which we all love. Um, <laughs> but I love personally like a good, Simple but complex beer because there's a lot more to this beer than just clear. Well, that's the thing. If you really <laughs> sat down and thought about it, you'd probably just think, hey, you know, it's a put it away. Comes in a big can, fits good in a lawnmower, and off I go, you know? <laughs> when, I, when, we were, when we were doing our training for Amsterdam, they always said, like, when you're, when you're talking to people and you're approaching them, ask them if have you had tried craft beer before. No, this is the starting point. That's kind of what there's this, this in their portfolio. This is sort of where this is their introductory, their gateway beer to kind of pull non-craft people in. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, I talk a lot of, to Ryan about, you know, the idea of a gateway craft beer. And that was actually the gateway craft beer for me. I remember when Amsterdam uh, used to be underneath that bridge on, uh, I guess it was like Bathurst and somewhere. And uh, that's where I used to go to buy the, the 25 pack of Amsterdam Blonde. And it was like, all right, this is way better than the Canadian that I'm getting. And I'd rather support these guys than be supporting this massive brewery. And 
from there, it led on to all the rest of their beers. I remember it was their downtown brown, their raspberry wheat, just incredible beers. Yeah, I, I, um, I used to live in a con. I used to live in a condo, but my balcony faced that that location. And um, I'd come home from work, and I wouldn't get home until like nine thirty or ten. But it'd be like, if it was a Friday or Saturday night, the LCBO LCBO is closed, but their bottle shop was open till eleven. So I used to always go in there and take my dog over and talk with the guys and stuff. And that's good. I the, the, like Amsterdam is the brewery that really got me into craft beer too. And as soon as I remember, I had the, like I think the beer that really got me into into wanting to learn more about it was probably a uh, bone shaker. And I think a lot of people will yeah. say that as, a, as a local example, they'll probably say, Hey, bone shaker was the first like IPA that I tried. And it was like, wait a minute, this is a different thing, you know? So <laughs> bit of an intense IPA. You consider what people are drinking nowadays, man. That's high, higher IBU, higher on the malt profile. Yeah, true enough. I know there's one of the guests we're going to have on later um, when we can schedule in is their first beer was a quad and that's what got them into craft beer. So you, it's interesting to see what people go through. <laughs> but I did get a comment on the side. The chat was at work, but I got it working. So Kelly, who happens to be my mom, shout out mom, who's watching and drinking along with us and my stepdad too, John, said it's got a sweet taste she found. So she got a nice little sweet taste to that Amsterdam uh, blonde as well, which is totally right. Um, kind of almost like a honey, but not on that same overbearing but there's that sweetness kind of you get maybe sweet grass or something yep yep i mean there's no real wrong answer um anything that you that you that you perceive is probably going to be along the lines of what other people get as well um if this had like like when you get to the, the crystal malt we'll all kind of pick up the same sort of realm of uh mm -hmm. area of different flavors and stuff, so. i think uh, it's funny too with tastings i just want to say um you only know what you know too when you're tasting it right like some people might know what diacetyl tastes like. I don't know what diacetyl tastes like, but um, I know what it is, but you know, like there's <laughs> people pick up flavors that they characterize it to, or um, we always talk a lot with uh, memories and kind of, you'll either love a beer or hate a beer because sometimes that flavor from the malts or whatever is in that beer triggers a memory for you. Um, and so for me, that's like, when I think of this beer, like every sip, it, I think of the farm. I think of whether I'm out in Saskatchewan at a family reunion or like as a work in the hay hay fields up in Midland, like it's that's what I taste. It's kind of those memory pieces too. I it's love probably it. like if there's fields and stuff up there, you're probably getting a lot of that stuff in the air, and that's that aroma and taste is probably just very familiar to you in that regard. So all the time, I'm one of those weirdos who loves the smell of fresh laid manure. So <laughs> hey, uh, you know what? There ain't nothing wrong with that. I think that that that's a bit of a nostalgic. Uh, uh, feeling and smell you get, you know, like we're all supposed to be of the land in that sense. True oh. enough. So Chris did have, you had a chart here, um, yeah. kind of to follow up this beer, just to maybe find some of these flavors in the beer that you're looking for. Yeah. What do you guys think? What do you guys pick up? I mean, these are, these are just sort of, these are the, the lists off the Wehrman chart. So it's some flavors, it's not all, but you could probably say, Hey, this is a uh, kind of multi-sweet, but it's also yeah. very, I think all three of us had biscuits, right? Yeah, yeah. biscuits. Yeah, yeah. Biscuit, maybe even a little bready. Sweet. Yeah, um, not you know like a lighter bread, like you know Texas toast, Wonder Bread kind of bready. The stuff my son loves. <laughs> and we'll stop at this chart after every beer as well. Cool to have a look and kind of let everybody mm -hmm. characterize and connect the flavors. And and like you said, the, there are other flavors too, like the yes. you know the vast variety of flavors that you get. This is just a, a kind of small microcosm of the the grander scale of flavors that are out there well these are specific to these are also specific to malts like you're gonna you'll notice that there's no like pineapple on there because that's a that's a hot a flavor that comes from hops and stuff right so mm -hmm. and before, yeah exactly yeah. i want to say is that uh i really want to get a bunch of people behind me to sign a petition to make them put amster uh put uh, bone shaker in the size can so just saying throw there it out. Go. That would be really cool. yeah. bone shakers yeah. in 568 i'm down in Dude, the only two beers I've seen Amsterdam do are three speed and blonde in that size. But I would absolutely love to see a bone shaker release in that format, man. That'd be incredible. We obviously have the canning line to do it. Come on. <laughs> Come on, Amsterdam, put bone shaker. <laughs> yeah, Mike's Mike made a good point. Mike says we're only got one beer tasted and we're in 50 minutes. So let's move along. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what do we got next? Mike, you are so right um you can you can always cheat mike come on now um so next we're going to look at crystal 60 and while we're while we're pulling this up pour your guys pour your sierra nevada um 
don't wait for us to start drinking it. Um, definitely pour it, start drinking it and we'll get into the beer and, and you can kind of chat along with us. So we're going to take a look now at the crystal malts quick and I'm going to pop up the piece here. Thanks Mike for your feedback as well. Appreciate that. My man, Mike is one of our uh, SC Simcoe County district beer drinkers association um no different mike different mike 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 from craft beer days is also joining us on here he's he's watching as well shout out to mike as well from craft beer days i always um, plug it anytime i can yes exactly <laughs> yes i got a couple of glasses up to, up top too i was and a shirt too but i was like i gotta wear i gotta wear the high gravity shirt today i did have mike's shirt on before um just before we jumped on um so crystal 60 while chris is talking i'll show so this is uh the crystal 60 that's used in sierra nevada right Yep. So a crystal 60, this is considered a light 60, uh, a, a, sorry, a light 60, a light crystal malt. A crystal malt can go anywhere kind of from uh, a 60 ish lobby bond, maybe a little bit south of that as well. This can go up to like a dark crystal that will be somewhere maybe 350 to 450 lobby bond. Uh, and that'll get you those really, really dark stone fruits. You'll get, you know, prunes, raisins, dark cherry, a lot of the stuff you get in um, like the kind of a, Probably not the exact malts you would use in like Belgian beers, but some of those kind of Belgian type flavors you would find in those malts. A lot of those come from yeast too. Um, so this is a light caramel, produces golden hues, which is the, the main thing we're going to see inside of Sierra Nevada. And a mellow candy-like sweetness. So it actually will sweeten up the grain bill a little bit. Um, this is considered a specialty malt. So with a specialty malt, you would, uh, unlike the, the pale ale malts, this can be 100% of the grain bill. You typically wouldn't use more than 15% of this malt in the grain bill because it's sweet. When you when you ferment the beer down, it'll be very cloying. Like it'll be way too sweet on, on the palate if you use too much of the stuff. Almost like if you use too much of one spice, same sort of difference, right? Um, and this this a lot of brewers will use this to enhance body, foam stability, and it'll also put a little bit of color in the beer too. So smell these, tell me what you guys get. Actually, you know, let's eat the grain first. You know, just that the, on the smell, I kind of, I'm reminded of what you said earlier. It does still remind me a little bit of that crust of a, a whole grain bread, like a really good whole grain bread. Taste the kernel. That's where a different, the, you'll notice a difference right away when you taste it. Oh, yeah. I get that sweetness in that. Mm. I get cherries, maybe like a, mm -hmm. a raspberry in it when I treat, when I eat it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Raisins. Oh. Sure. Sweet raisins, nut. yeah, almost like a figgy flavor, almost. Figs, yeah, definitely figs. That like high, high, high sweet kind of. Uh, mm. You know. Oh, that's a good tasting one. Oh, uh, Chris, I'm gonna like invest in like malt just to have a breakfast after this session, man. <laughs> These are so good. All right, let's smell it. Two tone, what you smell? Mmm. Like candied rum or something, candied raisins. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like currant, even. I smell uh, brown sugar. Mm-hmm. Or molasses, almost. Like yeah, like a molasses. Yeah. So I almost sniffed a grain up my nose. Put some water in there. Got some water in. I was a uh, step ahead. Now this mm. one, you notice so right you can see away. the color right away. Yes, that's what I wanted you guys to get to. So you notice if we put that up against the pale malt, you notice the color is quite a bit different. Yeah, I'm gonna bring us back to the, uh, the larger screen so you guys can get a better view here. Sorry, everybody. Yeah, there we go. There you go, yeah. So you can see that the, now if you look at the color, there's a bit of orange in there, a bit of red. Mm -hmm. Okay, so give that a smell now that we've got some water in there. Mm. You know, for me, a little bit of that molasses smell has amplified mm -hmm. now that I've added the water. Okay, so let's jump into Sierra Nevada. Mm. I think I'm having porridge for dinner after this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, pour your, you're already drinking it. I hope you're already drinking your Sierra Nevada. Oh, man. This is a this is an awesome beer. I I really love this beer, and I wish more people um, knew about the story behind it and everything too. Um, Sierra Nevada was actually this is actually the grandfather of the modern day IPA. This beer. 
wow man uh, there you like, go where's it from is it san diego uh it's i know it's from california i can't remember the exact wow. location i think i'm gonna say it on the can Whoa. mills river oh sierra nevada brewing chico california and mills river north carolina yeah so that's it. so two things that actually came out of this beer uh, oh if you actually if you pull the slide we'll talk about from there oh yeah there we go this beer, um, if you go read, um, Ken Grossman's got an awesome book where he talks about his story with Sierra Nevada and, with, and how the brewery came about. Um, this beer um, dates back to about 1981. In 1981, Sierra Nevada used a, a brand new uh, experimental hop called Cascade. So Cascade, we know now, is like it's you know a typical hop you find in IPAs and Cascade has turned to other things. And now, you know, Citra and things have kind of taken over and that kind of stuff. This is the original, like, uh, like grapefruity, juicy kind of hawk. Um, came out of this beer. And one other thing that they did with this too, if you look at the color of it, so you see how it's nice and orange? You get that nice orange hue on it. Mm -hmm. So this beer uses 10% Crystal 60 in the grain bill. So if you look uh -huh. at, go back to your Amsterdam Blonde and then look at that, 10% gives you that much color. And you'll notice the foam is really, really big on this beer. It doesn't go away. It did in my small glass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing the GLB lacing contest today. So it's <laughs> mm. So this, this beer is literally two malts. I've brewed, I've brewed a clone, a clone recipe of this beer a couple times. It's pretty straightforward. It's basically just pale malt, crystal 60 cascade hops, and then a bit of Magnum for the bittering side of it. And you got a fantastic beer on it. This is my first time actually having this one. I've seen it so, so many times. Oh, it's can condition too. Interesting. Um, yeah, this is, this is good. This is, this is reminiscent of IPAs 15 years ago. Um, like you said, like cascade is one of the big, you know, the big three C's. And mm -hmm. 15 years ago, you were only basically finding those three C's in your hops and the grain bill was probably very similar, right? Like the grain bills probably haven't changed in, you know, 20, 30 years. Well, um, I mean, this, that's a kind of classic IPA, like not like juicy new school IPA. This is a classic IPA grain. Mm -hmm. bill. So a little bit, mostly pale malt, one, maybe crystal 60, 80, 90, 120, somewhere in there to give it that richness. A little bit of sweet malt character inside of it, mm. nice color, a really bold color, and then just a pile of hops on top of it. Yeah, and you can find those like that. We were talking about it before we 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 jumped on. I'm going to uh, just come back here to our larger screen view. Um, you know the IPAs that lean into the malts. It, it's it's almost like a finer balance in creating a beer that you have to get a balance of both the malt and hop flavor than it is. Um, and today where we, you know, we, we see the dominant hops being, like you said, you'll have a simple grain bill overloaded with, you know, seven different hop varieties. Whereas this, um, there's a delicate balance because you, the hops really have to work well with the, the, the candied sugars you're getting, or, um, that molasses, like it comes through more in this, on that flavor that I get here. I so really like I enjoyed it. I don't think, um, I think the modern uh, craft beer nerd might be unaware of this. So this is definitely something you got to, you got to try. It needs to be on your bucket list because this beer, this beer deserves a lot of respect. That's a really good beer, Chris. I'm glad you chose that one for this. I know it's not a local, we, it's not an Ontario craft beer, but um, when you talk about something, like you said, if this has been around that long and this is like the OG of IPAs. Um, yeah, I can appreciate this through and through the, the all in all, it's a good beer, but I love the malt um, profiles we're getting from it because we are talking about malts. Um, I'm going to see, you know, what you guys are getting in the chats. If you guys want to drop any of those malt flavors you're getting, um, let us know. And it's so it's funny. Good. These are like, uh, you know, you talk about the, the malts and the hops and now the idea of the hops kind of really taking that, that step forward and being showcased more than anything else. But it sounds like the real science behind beer has always been to find that balance between what the hop is offering, what the malt is offering, what the yeast is offering, because they, they are pretty core elements in this overall process. Yeah, I mean, if, if you think about where beer has come from in the last, like, let's date back to here. I mean, this beer was probably the most bitter thing on the planet when they released it. And this probably blew people's heads off. It's like, oh, what, oh, what is this flavor? But because we're <laughs> so desensitized, all these sort of like 
overly hop, tropical, Australian, New Zealand hop beers. This doesn't seem bitter at all. Like our taste buds are already, are already way beyond what mm -hmm. this yeah. what this thing offers. Really, right? This is balanced. <laughs> Very. Like we're, right now, we're I think in general the theme we're so focused on hops that everyone's ignoring malts. And those classic big IPAs. And I'll go back to Bone Shaker again. Bone Shaker's got a lot of malts and a lot of big C hops in it to get that. Like it's a big beer all the way around. Uh, it's not just aroma heavy, and it's not just lupulin. Pardon me, lupulin, lupulin heavy. It's a nice balance on it. So, yeah. Perfect. So, what do you guys get on this one? Um, definitely like the malty sweet, maybe a bit of marmalade, raisin. I got some like about yeah. candy, like candied raisin almost. Dried fruits for sure on this one. Uh, almost a, a honey leaning towards molasses on this one. I'm getting. Slightly bitter for sure, sweet for sure, almost even a coffee leaning towards. Mm -hmm. You guys, it, like, do you find it's it's kind of coats your mouth a bit? It's it's like it leaves a bit of a sweet aftertaste. It mm -hmm. totally does, man. You still got that sweet aftertaste for sure lingering around. That's what I meant. Like what for that balance? Like to me, that's a good balanced beer. You get that that hop shit. To me, a good IPA that hop should hit you first, and then that malt should stick around after you've swallowed it and and play on the palate a little longer because those sugars typically stick stick around longer, right? So that to me is a very well balanced beer because you do get that little little bitter up front, but the malty sweetness kind of levels it out and it just sits nicely. Yeah, so it, it hangs around a lot longer than the blonde for sure. Yeah, I, I like this beer. Anything that comes off the barbecue, barbecue chicken, ribs, this is a perfect beer to pair with that stuff. Love it. Yeah. So next up, and guys, keep enjoying. Um, now we're moving fast, Mike, for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a hard time keeping up. So That's next one, uh, while we're waiting for Chris there, I'm just going to yeah. jump. Yeah, no, take your time, Chris. No worries, brother. It's going to jump, jump back to the uh, YouTube, see if anybody's got any, any comments in there. And let's get this continued. So the next one we're going to look at is the pale chocolate malt. And this is for our Henderson's Best. So if you guys want to crack your Henderson's Best while Chris is talking to us a little bit about the pale chocolate malts, and I'll show you what those look like in your camera there. Okay. All right, let's grab our pale chocolate here. Okay, so this is a pale chocolate, not a dark chocolate malt. So you're gonna get lighter chocolate notes off of this. Um, this particular grain is about 180 to 250 lobby bonds. If you look at it, it's it's still quite dark, but um, it's more brown to me. Like when I look at it, I see more brown than I see like black. Mm. Uh, so it, it's a mild malt. It's gonna get a little bit of flavor. It's not gonna overpower anything else. Um, this is a great malt for adding Ooh. color, smooth chocolate, a little bit of coffee, and a little bit of nutty flavors in it. Um, typically you would use something like this up to about 8% in stouts or one to 2% for adding color in light beers. Okay. So bite into one of those. Tell me what you guys get. All right. I'm going to bring it back here. Oh, I always bite into it more than one because they actually taste really good. Oh, you'd like a handful. Yeah. And they're like, it's like better than sunflower seeds. Take this to the ballpark. Oh dude, that tastes toasty. Yeah. It, you know, immediately I get that toastiness off of it. Got a little molasses sweetness, even. Almost like a mild coffee, like a yeah. decaf coffee for yeah. my decaf drinkers. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite dry. Like, it sounds mm -hmm. like the crystal, but it has like a, it's, crystal's very sweet. This is dry, and that's how I get it. Almost a little bitterness, too, too. I mm -hmm. found like there's like almost like that coffee bitterness after the fact I could sit there for a bit. Mm. Mm. What kind Interesting. of chocolate do you guys think that is? What does it taste like? What kind of chocolate? Oh, super bitter chocolate. Like 80% yeah. chocolate, 90% chocolate. Yeah. Tastes like those, you know those those chocolates you get for cooking that comes in like a big like unsweetened chunk? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's yeah, that bitter thing. chocolate. Yeah. Is it, yeah, I can't remember what they're called. That's that's kind of where that tastes. What do you guys smell? I smell like a crushed up one. Oh yeah, crushed up one, wrong one. I think this is quite different on the nose in the way it tastes. Very different. It's much lighter on okay. the nose than it is yeah. in the flavor. Yeah, the flavor really is. It's much more overpowering than the the scent. Yeah, I mean the even you know a, uh, the taste of this would be like a dark chocolate. The smell of this would be more towards a milk chocolate. Yeah, that's a good way of looking at it. I can agree with that. 
Yeah, I'm still getting like like a little smoky, almost yeah. a smoky coffee. Yep. Yeah, like a like it smells like a coffee shop. Yeah. Yeah, like but like not even a coffee shop, but like a roastery. Yeah. 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 Put some water in this guy here. Oh. Get the porridge mix going. All right, so we'll show a color comparison here to you guys too. So, so Ryan, after this actually, session, are you going to take a spoon to all of these ones and uh, maybe enjoy some of this? Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to use these other these grains as sunflower seeds, though. So, oh yeah, see, look at that difference. So, it's there's the, there's the color. I see more like a brown in this than I do. Yeah, a hundred. Yeah, yeah. This I think I put way more grains in mine than I should have. <laughs> I mean, the color on this to me, I see more like a brownie red. Yeah, absolutely. I got blue. Oh, wow. The smell, though. Oh, yeah. That, that jumps out at you for sure. It's like smoked, uh, almost like smoked cedar or something. Like, not cedar, but it's it's a smoked, smoked wood for sure. Yeah, smoked wood. Mm. No, maybe even cedar, eh, brother? Almost close, I mean, yeah. yeah. Well, let's let's jump in and fast, and we'll keep going here. All right, everybody, let's pull open the Henderson's best. So this one I love. This is a classic beer. It's one I tend to like to have in the fridge. This is always in my fridge because the grocery store that I can see from my house, I can buy it at the grocery store. I always have a couple cans of this on hand. Um, I really like this beer a lot. Um, it's an amber an amber beer because it's a, a a style that's not as sexy as some of the other stuff that's going on in the world right now. Uh, but amber be beers, for the most part, use a little a blend of mostly pale malts and a bit of crystal and a little chocolate. There's a to me when I when I drink this, and I smell it. This beer has a darker crystal and maybe a hint of chocolate. So I don't know the recipe on this one, but to me, I feel like there's some sort of something chocolatey in there if they've come to it from other means aside from using chocolate malt i don't know but i get a little bit of, a little hint of chocolate in this yeah so do i man i just took a sip of this and it i don't know if it's because i i bit into the malt prior to but i definitely get a little bit of chocolate chocolateness in there but i think with the with the crystal malts you definitely get more of those cherry like brighter stone fruit kind of flavors there's definitely like figs i get cherries in there comparison to so there you have your three comparison there, your clear and all the way to Henderson. Henderson is definitely, that sounds like, um, like almost drunken raisins in that one this time for some reason. Like, I don't know. I like that one. That's a good one. Or something too. I don't know. What are you guys getting in the, in the chats there? Feel, feel free to drop what you're tasting in there. Yeah, this beer to me is very malt. It's very malt sweet. Yeah, Mike. What we what we're gonna have to do is in the future we we might even need to release a kit. You know, mm -hmm. a collaboration with Chris on that one. A high gravity supply yeah. splash or elements where we send you guys like the actual ingredients with the beers or something, so you guys can be there with us on this one. Because realistically, this really does help a lot, and and that's yeah. why. Chris for you know at least shooting this off to us because the beer alone is amazing and you know the descriptions are great but to have the malts there is incredible I yeah no we do this another time i'll actually reach out to some of the brewers to find specific malts that they're using and then i'll source those malts and we'll we'll get oh, that would be too cool yeah yeah we talked about doing it too with hops where we'll we'll actually send a hop package out um but yeah mike thank you for the feedback i do appreciate that um again we do want to do this more often too, right? This is the first time we've done this and we're always learning guys. We're always learning and That's we true. grow off feedback. We love your feedback. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, so there, uh, Mike says he gets a little bit of like spice and bread on that Henderson's best. Um, Kelly says this would be great served with hot chicken wings. Now we're talking. <laughs> yes. Are you bringing them by mom? That's the next question. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm getting straight caramel off of this one. Mm -hmm. like it definitely has a, a darker crystal and probably that 60. I was going to say almost like um, when you're cooking sugar on the stove to make caramel or something, when it's really oh, amber color, like that's yeah. almost on the nose too. I think that, that I get that tiny pop of chocolate in the after. Mm -hmm. it it, it, it's always throwing me off in this beer because I don't, they, like typically amber, amber ales will sometimes have chocolate in it and they sometimes won't. 
but it's very muted in this beer, but I still I still pick it up somewhere in there. So, so I'm gonna share the the flavor the the flavor scale here. So I would definitely say for me some raisin. Wrote maybe even some roasted almonds. Like I got almost a sweeter nut, not almonds, but maybe macadamia nuts. I don't know. Those are just sweeter. I know. Um, dark caramel for sure. I found it was more in the top, almost on the toffee side, like um, mm -hmm. sponge toffee. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I almost got it towards the molasses. You know. Mm hmm. Hmm. All right. So moving along. Well, I get some more water. Yeah, I gotta clean, cleanse those palates, or drink those beers, whatever you guys are doing. I'm gonna be saving mine for as we go, because that's yeah. And hopefully, pretty. you guys got some food around too, because we're enjoying a lot of beers today, and you want to have something to help with that. Yeah. Okay. So our last one we got here. This is Carafa Special Two. Um, Carafa is a it's a um, it's it's a debittered malt, so it's very very dark, but it doesn't have any astringency in it it's not uh you don't get that like acrid, like acrid type, type of taste um this is about a 450 ish lobby bond remember that scale goes to around 600 so this is almost as dark as things get uh it's a, it's a it's a this will add a bit of uh coffee brown like color uh you get a coffee like bouquet subtle smokiness as well as when you add this into a beer it's going to enhance the body and the mouthfeel of the beer itself uh, and this will actually, the reason why people use this as a specialty malt is specifically because it produces beer with, uh, as it says in the descriptor, unusual smoothness and firm, creamy white foam. Mm. Like a good old porter stout, which we're going to be <laughs> cracking open here shortly. So guys, feel free to join if you're just finishing the Hendersons by all means, but we're going to be moving on to the porter here now. So we'll talk quickly about the malts and then we'll, uh, talk more in depth about the beer. All right, let's have a bite of that grain and see what we come up with. Now, this is very, very dark. Oh, wow. This reminds me of bitter, into though. Coffee. It reminds you of what, sorry? Biting into a coffee bean. Mm hmm Mmm. Yeah. Mm. But not as bitter. That's not. I, I was expecting it to be a little more bitter mm -hmm, than mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. The flavor is like it tastes like whatever a dark, dark flavor would be. It tastes like that, but it's not. It's not like you bite and you're like, Ugh. you know, it's it's not. It, it, you can tell that it's been debittered. Mm -hmm. There's a sweetness in there too. Like there is a strong bitterness, but there's almost also a sweetness that you get right off of it. Like a burnt, all like a no. You're a I feel like marshmallow. It, yeah, yeah, like a burnt marshmallow, burnt yeah. sugar, like kind of, you know. Yeah. With that sweetness after, mm -hmm. but you get that kind of like smoky, and nothing beats a good burnt marshmallow, come on. You know, it's almost even like a, and this is going to sound weird, like a pumpernickel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a dark a dark breads, yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you guys smell in the crushed malt? Hmm. You know. I, coffee for sure. Uh, I, I get low coffee, no doubt. And again, I feel like I'm getting like either like a, a rye or a pumpernickel type smell off of it as well. Yeah, I, rye for sure. I think that there's like a little smoke. Smoke, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how to describe it. I think it's like a smooth, subtle touch of smoke in there somehow. I don't know. Got some water. Oh, that looks home like stretch here. Home stretch. Looks like English fresh pre French press coffee in here. <laughs> yeah, it does. It has a lot of that. And this one's this one's interesting too because as soon as you put water in it, it's black. Like yeah, you, know, you can't see through that. You can't suck. <laughs> like no, it's like an espresso. Black. It's very woodsy. Yep, a little bit of woody woody notes in there. Mm hmm. Like maybe chestnut. Yeah, actually, I, I can see that. Like, there's, there's definitely kind of, some kind of nut in there. Hmm. Well, let's, let's let's jump over to Clifford Porter. Here. Now, again, I don't know if this exact malt is in this beer, but there's definitely something in this realm inside of this porter. So we talked about this is Clifford's. 
you guys have this before? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yes. The, my, I will fight anyone that disagrees with the best porter in Ontario. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, it's incredible, dude. This you. is a great go-to. If you get the barrel-aged version, you're flying. The phone what the heck? I didn't even know there was a barrel-aged version. Barrel-aged version. Oh, it's out every now. Look, look at the foam on that. Mm -hmm. The head, you were just talking about that, too, in the malt, right? Yeah. It's like a, a malt like this is the kind of thing you'd put a little bit, maybe two, three, four, five percent in the beer. Like that. And I have no idea if that's what, what is in the recipe, but... To get that kind of a result is you'd probably use a malt similar to this. You know? mm. So there's your yeah, color comparison for all the malts for those who are. It's funny, Chris, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a coffee guy as well. Mm. And I look for something on coffee called a crema. And that crema is kind of like a nice dark tone that you get. That's kind of like a little cream on top. And as we've gone through these different beers, you look at these kinds and this on top looks like the coffee, the crema on a coffee that you'd get like an espresso. Mike says it has smoke on the nose, which I agree with coffees, dark chocolates, and maybe like dark red cherries, cranberries. Mm -hmm. Now a beer like this might have oh yeah, something kind of like one from each category of these four malts inside of it. It's quite likely when you build a porter or a stout, you'd probably use a little bit of everything in it too. You know, this almost, I get a little raspberry off of there as well. I do get a berry and I cannot like, yeah, I found a little bit of a, of, of almost a berry flavor in there. Could also be the palate coming off of the Henderson. <laughs> I mean, look at, I mean, if you look at the malts now that have been chilling out for a while. Yeah. Really come out on these four. And you can see the comparison to the beers after they're filtered. <laughs> there you go. It's a good flight board. Shout out to, I got, bought this flight board just for the show too. Check out beercrates.ca guys for those flight boards. They're like 25 bucks each. They're really good. That thing looks too cool. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> it's awesome. Oh yeah. So Mark says that Porter is making me thirsty. Good looking beer. Mark, if you, it's a great Porter. Oh, excuse me. The variety of beers. Oh, yeah. um, Bebo at third moon that has a, what was called death dealer. I think it is. Very, very good. I have one in the fridge. I have that that one and the marshmallow version. So I'll get to that next week because now it's uh, back to balance. No beer, no beer till a weekend. <laughs> Normally we do. What's that? Well, I mean, today, yes. I still got all this to go. <laughs> and whatever's left in those cans because me too, man. <laughs> well, I mean, this, oh, is a pretty, this is pretty approachable stuff. So, I mean, and, yeah. Uh, Sure. You guys have any other questions? Anything else you want to look at here? What do you guys think? I think that was wild to be able to, you know, for me, be able to steep some of these malts and mm. start to get that profile of what that wart would be like when they were making this beer. I can't wait to bring that upstairs to figure out how I'm going to dispose of it in an appropriate way. That's approved by my wife. <laughs> and if you pour all four of these into into something and then put some pizza, and some bread yeast on top, you'll make a little beer. So, oh, there you go. Really? <laughs> yeah. I mean, these have been steeping. Feel sugars in the water now, so you could get a tiny fermentation and make make a tiny beer out of this. Oh, there you go. We're gonna make a pastry heavy after this. <laughs> these are, these are weak. <laughs> dark so yeah. <laughs> that's too that's good. too good i love it I, I think it's really cool to see the comparison mm -hmm. in the actual malt teas to the beer like it's mm -hmm. exact same colors i love it i think this this has been great uh chris like really honestly i can't thank you enough for taking the time mm -hmm. to do this with us um you know you put all this together and you know i can't thank you enough man that's uh time out of your day to do so we really appreciate that I appreciate really it. Thanks for giving me a platform to talk about beer nerd stuff. So I really do appreciate that. Dude, we are beer nerds and we appreciate any time that you can come on and educate us and talk to us more about these kinds of ingredients. We love it. Absolutely. Absolutely. If, you guys want, if you guys want to do this again, we can do uh, mail out kits and stuff like that. I mean, this is probably a good, a good dry run to kind of know what to expect and stuff. So mm -hmm. uh -huh. we'll have this chat again in the future. Yeah, Absolutely. I think we should. We'll chat. We'll chat about that. I, I I think we have some great ideas about some fundraiser opportunities where we can run something exactly like this and get more people involved, some breweries involved too, and see where we could take it. But th this was fun. I I'm all about learning. This is one of my um, goals this year was to continue my beer education. So this was actually really really uh, great for me. So I appreciate that, brother. 
Um, oh. If you'd like to learn about more about malt, malt. <laughs> <laughs> look for the book about malt. 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 <laughs> malt. If you want to learn all about malt, um, <laughs> this series of books, if you want to get really, really technical on stuff, um, these books here, there's four of them, obviously one for each ingredient. There's water, yeast, malt, and hops. Uh, if you want a good resource, this is a good book to, to pick up. It's a, a decent read. You can get through it, but uh, it talks about the history of malting and uh, historical practices and modern day stuff in the malt house and it goes through a lot of these kind of ingredients we've talked about today a little bit of recipe building that we talked about today too and yeah. yeah great for any beer enthusiast that just wants to learn more about the ingredients that go into the product that they consume absolutely that's it you know what else is great for beer enthusiasts amazing beer gear hell yeah um, Chris, we said at the beginning, tell us where we can find your your gear, man. Um, I, I love it. I have a couple shirts upstairs and and honestly, guys, like quality. Not even it's not even a plug. I was just saying this because this is good gear. But I, I'm Chris is Chris is person about quality of stuff. So yeah, um, well it is. So where can we find you? Check it out. Check me out on uh, High Gravity Supply Co. on Instagram, High Gravity Supply Co. Uh, dot com for the website. And yeah, you can also follow me on Instagram at Italian Every Pint. I'm not on there quite as much because I'm trying to keep the business going, and that takes the majority of my uh, social media time. So he'll come back when we can do bottle trades again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> for I look forward who, to those, man. <laughs> yes. For those who don't know, Chris sets up, or b before this crazy world we're living in, set up some amazing bottle trades in the. Oh, the most Toronto epic. Area. The most epic, man. Like, I've seen bottles at those trades that I never even knew existed, man. <laughs> like, wild. Love like, it. I, I, I think I've forced Robin more than once to like basically trade all the stuff he has with him to get other stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so these trades are always fun for that. You know, you go there and you always try to see like, what does somebody else have? Well, I got these ones. Let's see what we could trade it for. <laughs> well, Robin's no slouch with what he brings to a bottle trade. I, I see that guy's seller. It's something ridiculous. <laughs> Too good. Get a shot for the Instagram guys. Give a big smile. <laughs> This is awesome. Yeah. Cheers, everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody who joined us. We had like 12 people joining us, which is pretty awesome for us. We've never done this before. No, that was um, wild for first run, man. Holy moly. We're going to start running our regular podcast live, guys. Um, so keep your eye for that. And Chris, we will get you back for another tasting exactly. and hang out anytime. Stick with us. We'll jump off live and we'll chat as we, uh, as, as we leave the live here. But Robin, brother, good to, good to see you having a beer again. Oh, hell to the yeah good to see you having a beer too man cheers <laughs> we'll to that resume to non-alcoholics for the weekdays but that was incredible man wow. yeah absolutely cheers gentlemen thank you everybody for watching we really appreciate your time and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon